Good evening, everybody. This is Kelly Williams. I'm from the Medical University of South Carolina. I'm um, one of the early career immunologists um, committee members and happy to host or moderate our CSI, uh, CIS um, case conference webinar series tonight. We have some excellent um, presentations and um, senior mentors joining us. And so I think I will um, first um, thank LACID and USID Net for hosting our webinar. Um, and then remind everybody that we're always happy to take interesting cases to discuss at these future case conferences. You can just contact any of the um, CIS staff or any of the ECI committee members if you have a case you think would be interesting enough to present. Um, and I guess with that, I will introduce Vivian Saper, Dr. Vivian Saper from Stanford, um, who's going to be one of our mentors in these interesting cases. Vivian? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me? I'm nervous that I, I can't yes. hear you as well. I can't hear her. Um, okay. It looks like she lost connection. So I guess we'll give I'm Dr. Saber just a Um, Dr. Ferguson, do you want to start maybe, or Dr. Stolls? Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to. And then when she connects, I guess she can give her overview? Yeah, I think that's, that's reasonable. I'm trying to, um, I can pull up her email of the questions she wanted to have. have. Um, but in any case, yeah, no, I'm... Um, Uh, yeah, no, I'm, 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 I can start if that's okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, what I, what I, the overview is that this is a patient who has had a, um, what we thought was a, a typical course, but has had some complications uh, of systemic onset inflammatory juvenile arthritis, and um, wanted to give a overview of her sort of clinical course with her. Uh, documentation and, and labs and, and um, various um, imaging studies and, and see if anyone had sort of thought about that. That's what Dr. Saper wanted to uh, add in, but I'll, I'll get going and then you can give me the hook when she, she comes uh, back. Um, so this is, uh, this is, is the Isabella. She's the patient I saw. And, um, she started in, uh, so she was born in, in December of 2013 and she presented to our hospital First in January in 2015, she was taken care of by my partner at that time, and she was uh, presented with uh, no significant past medical history. She was full term. She had normal growth and development to that point, and she presented with two weeks of fever. Uh, she was diagnosed with Kawasaki disease in the emergency department and um, received two doses of IVIG. Ultimately, uh, rheumatology was consulted after the failure of the first one, um, but after the second IVIG. She was afebrile for 36 hours, and she was subsequently discharged. So this was her labs on that initial admission at, at essentially two years old. Um, she fit for pretty consistent with Kawasaki disease. She had some uh, normocytic anemia. Uh, she had um, some thrombocytosis. Uh, she had a high sed rate. She had a high CRP. Uh, and her ferritin was elevated, but it wasn't uh, out of the ranges of one would expect for Kawasaki disease. So she came back about a month later with fever for three days. And at this time, because she carried the diagnosis of uh, having previously had Kawasaki, she was admitted our service. Um, at that time, her ferritin was greater than 6,500. Uh, her hemoglobin was 6.2. Uh, this brought on a hematology consult. Um, they completed a bone marrow biopsy, which was normal. Uh, labs to Cincinnati showed normal NK function and normal perforinone granzyme. So at that time, she was diagnosed with systemic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, she got started on one milligram per kilogram per day of prednisone and its BID dosing. And just as a point, two points of clarification, um, I, I didn't know how you would prefer to have it, so I gave the total 24-hour dose of steroid throughout this uh, presentation. 
But when it's Q-day dosing, I kind of don't mention it. When it's BID dosing, I, I mention it. Um, but the total 24-hour dose was one milligram per kilogram. Um, and the meds are in the back. The, uh, I try to be consistent about putting her current medications as the time of the slide just for uh, ease because you'll find she's on a lot of them. So at this point, my partner uh, diagnosed her with systemic onset J. I felt that the steroid was not uh, reducible without her being febrile, so she, he started her on canakinumab, and she received her first dose in February of 2015. Canakinumab is an anti-IL-1 monoclonal antibody. Um, so this was the labs at that hospitalization. Um, she, uh, she had a very high ferritin, high inflammatory markers. Uh, she was persistently anemic and, and had consistent thrombos, or persistent thrombocytosis. One month later, she came back with another febrile illness. She was admitted from the emergency department. Uh, they had been weaning the steroid, but she was bumped back up to one milligram per kilogram per day, uh, and she got the second dose of canakinumab at that time. Uh, labs at that time are um, sort of largely under, uh, unchanged. She has continued to have high sed rate, high ferritin. Uh, this time, the soluble IL-2 receptor came back, and it came back at uh, about 3,000, 3,100. Continuing monthly febrile illnesses, uh, she came to the emergency department. This time, however, they, they uh, noted her to have a febrile UTI, and ultimately Proteus would grow from the culture. She was given ceftriaxone and augmentin. She completed a 10-day course. Um, the prednisone wasn't uh, changed. It was, it was kept at the one milligram per kilogram per day dosing. Uh, labs at that time, a uh, little, co little confusing, at least for me, because the sed rate and CRP weren't as high as I would have expected for someone who's acutely infected. Um, and she, at that time, also had this sort of hyperferritinemia and, and an elevation in the soluble IL-2. Um, but her hemoglobin had crept back to normal, and she didn't have any uh, thrombocytosis. So she went a couple months at this point, but unfortunately, in, in two months later, she was admitted again for persistent fever and hyperferritinemia. Um, at this time, uh, my partner stopped the canakinumab. She had been on it for four doses and not had a significant benefit. Uh, and, and he started her on anti-IL-6 therapy. The steroid was increased to about two times what she was on to two milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, and interestingly, after the first anti-IL-6, uh, she was able to reduce the dose to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day. Uh, unfortunately, this seemed to be short-lived because she had a fever three days after her first of the tocilizumab doses. Uh, the initial dosing was at 12 milligrams per kilogram, but she was uh, had thrombocytopenia as a side effect, so they dropped it to 8 milligrams per kilogram, and the platelet uh, count rebounded. So these are her labs from that admission, um, and, and they're largely uh, unchanged. So a month later, she, this was an outpatient visit, but they noted that she had persistent fever, and uh, at this point, my partner started her on cyclosporin, uh, and her prednisone was steady at 1 milligram per kilogram per day. Uh, she was she was actually continuing the tocilizumab uh, with that. Um, in August of 2015, she was admitted with fever and development of joint pains. There's no documentation of synovial hypertrophy or an effusion anywhere, uh, but she was admitted with a refusal to walk, and a, a, her parents said she had a stiff neck. So August 2015 is when she first came into my care. Um, interestingly enough, she was, uh, well, interesting for me at least, she was my first patient out of fellowship, so it was a, a good rocky transition for me. Um, so she was admitted after having uh, a week at home between the year. Uh, I'm hearing some stuff, so I don't know if that was somebody had a, oh, okay, never mind. Um, certainly someone can interrupt me if they have a question or, or need to give me the hook or anything like that. Um, so she came to my care in August of 2015. She was admitted uh, for having a fever for a week. Uh, she was noted at tachypnea in the evening and required two liters of oxygen via nasal cannula. At that point, she had received a chest uh, CT and was noted to have some lung disease. Uh, other labs were also considered for macrophage activation syndrome. She was anemic, thrombocytopenic, she had hyperferritinemia. Uh, I'm going to show you the labs and the pictures in a moment, but I started her on anakinra at this time, four milligrams per kilogram every 24 hours. And this was associated with an almost immediate resolution of her fever, and the labs got normalized after uh, two or three days. Um, she had an equivocal quantiferon at this point, which is really not surprising given her steroid burden, um, but because of that, we started her on uh, INH therapy. 
So this is the lab uh, at that visit. She had an impressive leukocytosis um, with uh, impressive anemia and thrombocytopenia um, with a, a high CID rate. Not a terrible CRP and not actually a terrible for her uh, ferritin. So this is what we noted. Uh, some, some, it's, not, it's not the best picture, but she has very profound clubbing, and you can see it on the thumb, um, and it's only gotten worse over, over time. So the CT chest was read as nonspecific interstitial and ground glass pulmonary opacities, um, bilateral uh, lower lobe involvement. Uh, and at that point, they, they thought it was consistent with uh, systemic onset JIA, um, specifically the sort of macrophage activation syndrome uh, stuff. Um, and, and she had notable bilateral axillary lymphadenopathy. And, and here are some pictures from that initial um, CT scan. So a month after that, uh, she was um, seen as an outpatient and then subsequently admitted. She was on a high level of steroid, two per kilo per day, um, and she developed thrush at that time, so we tried to drop it again to one milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, but after that, the fever recurred fairly quickly. Uh, so we increased the anakinra to eight milligrams per kilogram uh, every 24 hours. She was admitted with fever, anemia, and neutropenia. Um, and at this time, she, uh, we started having a, a discussion with the people at the NIH, and, and um, we sent the interferon signature, uh, which is what they were studying at that point. Uh, labs at that time, uh, actually not terrible, um, with the exception of a hyperferritinemia. Um, her white count, her uh, hemoglobin and platelets were, were normal. I just had the opportunity to click on the attendee chat. I, I don't know if people have questions and they want me to stop. Um, I'm trying to advance the slides and it's not doing it. Oh. All right, I've gone too far. All right, so um, in October of 2015, uh, we saw her, she was stable. Her parents, and me for that matter, were too fearful to change the medicine, so she was um, uh, kept. Oh, sorry, I just saw the question for four minutes about compliance issues. Uh, potentially, yes. She has um, very young parents, and um, but she seems to have, um, they, they seem to be very on the ball with how much they're giving her of every medicine. They seem to, you know, they're, they're very good with coming to visits. Their, their grandparents are involved, too. So I don't believe that she does have uh, compliance issues. Um, so. so in December of 2015, we, we saw her again, and we said, okay, we need to get you off this steroid. It's been a long time. Um, so we told them that they could wean the steroid by two milligrams up to every five days if they feel that she's doing well. And doing well meant she was comfortable, and she um, was afebrile. Um, in February of 2016, she's had a pretty good stretch. She's been largely afebrile for these past three months. Uh, we rate adjusted the anakinra um, closer to 10 milligrams per kilogram, uh, largely because her parents were saying she had some days where she wasn't feeling so good, but it was very nonspecific. She wasn't febrile, she didn't have a rash, uh, and she didn't have any specific joint pains. She did get down to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day of steroid, uh, and although she complained of sporadic joint pains, we did, I didn't note any clinical evidence of arthritis. So in April 2016 is when she was evaluated at the NIH. Um, and, and on the right is the um, interferon signature uh, that was, was done there. And, and, um, and I see Scott Gattis here, so I would encourage him to tell me the, the more specifics of it. But my understanding of it is that it's a genetic um, uh, test which gives you propensity to activate the interferon part of the, uh, the immune system. And, Healthy controls, there's a, a frequent, you know, essentially there's zero uh, escalation. And auto-inflammatory, uh, Scott has just said it's the weighted sum of interferon responsive genes, um, which is a nicer way of saying uh, that. Um, so uh, she is the very far end of that, and, and she didn't quite fit the classic auto-inflammatory of candle or uh, sabi, but she definitely didn't have a normal response uh, either. Uh, at the NIH, she also had a bronchoscopy done, 
Um, and her PCR for pneumocystis was positive, but there was no culture positivity and um, sort of a, a – but at that point she, she – um, and at that point she didn't have persistent uh, pulmonary symptoms. So she was on about half a milligram per kilogram per day of steroids. She was on cyclosporin. She was on anakinra. Uh, naproxen was given uh, as needed. Um, uh, and, and she was on isoniazid as well. So in May of 2016, because of the um, both the previous uh, CT findings and the uh, description of her mother that she was tachypnic when she slept, uh, and her mother was arranging her on pillows every night to keep the tachypnia down, we had a sleep study. Um, and this, it showed mild desaturation, uh, but they didn't feel that there was a need to supplement oxygen at that point. Um, but she did, again, present with fever, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. Uh, so at this point, she was uh, she had been uh, a couple rounds of sort of macrophage activation syndrome-like concerns, so we gave her a pulse of cyanidrol. Um, and, and at that point, we also started her on Bactrim for PP, PCP uh, prophylaxis. So we, we had retrospectively learned at that point that she stopped the INH, um, which is, does call credence to... Ian, I have, I have one question. Are you able to hear me? Please. It's Vivian. I'm here. I'm yeah. here with Betsy. So I'm a little confused on the um, PCP prophylaxis. My understanding was that she actually got a treatment course then as well, and that was during that MAS. Is that correct? And then you started the prophylaxis. Yeah, that is fair. She did. She received a... Um, uh, oh, I think it was 21 days actually, but I'm, but I'm, uh, I'm, I am blanking on the length, but she did get a treatment course. You're right. Right. And that was during the MAS hospitalization and about the eosinophils. Um, uh, I guess I'll do my little preamble after you're done, but we do see an eosinophil, um, uh, spike even on children that are, that are taking their, um, steroids and it precedes the lung disease in a certain number of the cases, but go ahead and I'll talk about that later. So in, the, in this hospitalization, we ended up treating her for macrophage activation syndrome. Uh, she, uh, hematology saw her and said they wouldn't recommend anything because she didn't meet HLH criteria. Uh, she was severely anemic, so we ended up transfusing her, um, and she was discharged after uh, she was afebrile for 48 hours. And we discussed an additional DMARDs, um, but there had been some uh, reluctance. So this is the, the last from that hospitalization. Um, she had... Um, an impressive bandemia uh, at that time. So this is the result from the sleep study. We don't have to read the whole thing, but she has um, some episodes of desaturation, um, as well as a couple episodes of central apnea and hypopnea. Um, but their recommendations um, were that there wasn't necessarily a need for supplemental oxygen. Uh, at that time. But they did think she had periodic limb movement uh, issues, um, and they, interestingly, at least for me, they they wanted to treat any ferritin above 70 because the thought of it is that that re re uh, reduces these periodic limb movements. Um, so I was reassured to tell them her ferritins were in the hundreds to thousands all the time. Um, so in July of 2016, having gone through these things uh, with our discussion of additional DMARDs, uh, with, with the ultimate goal of getting her off the steroid, because as you'll see at the end, she's had um, quite a bit of um, growth arrest, which is part disease, but I think there's a medication in, uh, involvement as well. Um, we had thought about it. We had added at that time tofacitinib uh, after extensive discussion with um, the group at the, the NIH. Um, so at that point, she was on prednisone, she was on cyclosporin, she was on anakinra, she was on tofacitinib, naproxen, and, and Bactrim. And just reading that, I get nervous about the amount of immune suppression she was on, um, which, of course, leads us to the next slide uh, a month later when she was admitted for fever and was found to have uh, neutropenia. Um, the, the difficulty was, so she, because she, so she had this diaper abscess, um, we asked for surgery to come see her and an ultrasound at the same time, and, and surgery looked at her and said, no, we don't need an ultrasound. That'll drain no problem. And then they took her to the OR, and they 
tried to drain it, but got nothing. They got, she has no neutrophils, so she wasn't able to main, mount an abscess response. Um, so, but the swab did grow pseudomonas. Um, at that time, she was held on the tofacitinib, the cyclosporin, and the anakinra. Uh, the cell counts returned after about a week, and then the perfuse drainage came. Uh, and at that time, her mother just, just flat out refused to restart the anakinra. It was too much of a hardship for the family. Um, so, but we did restart the tofacitinib at half of the previous dose. Uh, so this is the um, the labs from the uh, admission with the abscess, which had a, a very appropriate. Uh, this is largely to show that, um, in in her at least, the infection is easy to say because her CRP shoots so high up, but her ferritin doesn't typically doesn't typically budge. Um, but she had zero neutrophils. She had fortunately she had a couple bands, but um, she didn't have much. Uh, so we had repeated the chest X-ray in August of. 2016, which was the, I'm sorry, the chest CT in August of 2016, which was a, a one year after the initial one. Um, and they said it was pretty, pretty similar um, to the previous one. And um, I can show you the pictures. Um, I'll, I'll be, I'll be quick, uh, Dr. Mellons. So this is the pictures from this. Um, so September of 2016, same thing. Uh, it just wouldn't heal. Uh, so she got admitted again. Uh, at that point, they said she had a pneumonia, got some cephalosporin, and she stopped the tofacitinib. So at this point, she was just on prednisone and a cephalosporin. Uh, these are the labs at that time. Um, so in October of 2016, we, we really keep chipping away. We continued the cephalosporin. The parents at this time had self-discontinued the Bactrim for a skin rash, and we tried some inhaled pentamidine, which she maintained for a while. Um, she's been clinically, she was clinically well from November to March. Um, never got the steroids below 0.5. Um, she had a febrile illness, was rhinovirus positive, and, and again, she didn't mount that ferritin elevation, so we weren't too concerned about that. Um, she randomly got a, or not randomly, we set up for her to get a Make-A-Wish trip, and she went and had fun. Um, they stopped doing the pentamidine because, uh, unfortunately, the patient got too mad about the treatment, so they, they decided it wasn't a hardship worth fighting for them. Uh, here's her CT in two, uh, approximately six months after, which shows the worsening uh, lung disease. Uh, it's worth noting she doesn't hasn't required um, supplemental oxygen therapy at this point. She had a lung biopsy um, for concern of worsening disease, and this was read in Seattle Children's. Um, Gail Deutsch is, is, was recommended to us as being one of the people who sees a lot of these things. Um, so um, the, the 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 biopsy um, was. Uh, she felt consistent with previous uh, patients. Um, October of 2017, she had the fever, and, and uh, again, and she had a chest X-ray, and I'll show you the pictures of that, um, which is pretty standard for her sort of the way her chest X-rays sort of look. And at that point, I, we started her on um, – her labs were not too impressive uh, for inflammation, but we started her on azithromycin um, – and, and since then, she's, she's been relatively well. So I last saw her in last month. Um, she continues to follow pulmonary. She doesn't have any supplemental oxygen requirements, although they describe her as teetering. Um, she's clinically well. She's been afebrile. The prednisone varies. She's sort of maintained on cyclosporin and seems to be doing well on that. Uh, and I, I wanted to show her growth chart. Um, so the initial evaluation, um, and then since then, she's not had uh, very much weight gain, and, and all the weight gain she's had, I've... Uh, Steroids have certainly played a role in that, um, and then her linear growth has even been more uh, arrested. Um, so I also have big summary slides of all of her labs, but if we're running short on time, they don't have to be put up, and certainly questions can be asked while it's put up. Um, <coughs> no, she doesn't seem to have any gut disease. Um, but we also haven't done a scope or anything like that. So I, I guess I'll, uh, Vivian, if you want to sort of. Uh... Ian, th thank you um, very much. And thank you to the attendings and to CIS. I'm, I'm sorry I got knocked off of the. Oh, OK. Can you still hear me? I think you can. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think you can. Yeah, you're just switching the slides. OK. Um, so for some uh, reason, I got I got dropped at the very beginning, but I heard pretty much everything that you said, Ian. And um, the things that I wanted to do a little bit in the in the in the preamble, which I don't think were um, 
or gone through, but, but excuse me if I've missed, missed them, is that um, uh, I think the audience are a lot of people that don't know S SJIA, and Ian, I think you did um, uh, talk about that uh, a bit. It is a classification of um, illness uh, in the absence of other illnesses. It's characterized by um, arthritis by a particular pattern of um, fever. There is a specific type of um, rash, which is uh, evanescent and not fixed. There can be hepatosplenomegaly, serositis, but the kind of lung disease that we're seeing has, has not been described um, other than a sporadic case similar here and there within the context of SJIA. And we have a collection now, and this case of Ian's and the next case of um, uh, uh, Dr. Matt Stoll's uh, um, are, are each a case from the series of now 61 cases. And there are certain things that are very distinctive that we wanted to see the collected wisdom if you had some things that you could add to our thinking on this. The case series, by the way, focused on the beginning of the SJIA the course of the medications and the onset of lung disease. And what Ian is talking about and Matt are talking about actually carries on and goes through the lung disease and, be, and beyond. Um, new in the treatment of, of, S, of SJIA um, are the inhibitors of IL-1 and IL-6. And you can see the anakinra um, uh, throughout the course uh, more recently discontinued in um, the patient that Dr. Ferguson just um, presented. And this lung disease has not really been noted until the advent of, of those uh, medications. Things that we are seeing that are very different from uh, SJIA or as a clinical program, you saw the acute clubbing, which of course is an alarm uh, uh, flag of something going on in the lungs. Prior to that, there are children that have had tremendous abdominal pain unexplained and, um, and even um, far more of them, in fact, all of them seem to have a profound drop in lymphocytes prior to the onset of lung disease. Plus, as Dr. Ferguson showed you, there is a spike in eosinophils. With early recognition, we see that spike occurs um, approximately a month before um, lung disease is detected. Before, the, before lung disease becomes, becomes apparent. We've seen that um, to tremendous amounts, up to about 40% and 13,000 eosinophils. However, even in some children that were on up to one and a half milligrams per kilogram per day of steroid, we'll see a thousand um, eosinophils. It seems to be a pretty strong one-time peak that then extinguishes with or without the um, steroids. Um, so we don't really understand the profound drop in lymphocytes, which is um, uh, pretty much uh, Seventy-five percent of them are less than sixty percent of the lower limit of normal. So this is a profound lymphopenia that precedes or accompanies the first onset of um, recognizing lung disease. Looking for um, infections, as Dr. Ferguson told you, we haven't really found much, but there is some suspicion, and in his case, that pneumocystis can can be involved, and that's despite not seeing it on um, uh, direct uh, direct um, uh, microscope microscopic detection on BAL or on um, uh, lung biopsy. And uh, DFA has been done, direct fluorescent antibody analysis on lung biopsies. Gail Deutsch in Seattle did that on as many that she had samples to do so, and we don't see it there. However, um, early in the disease and in, in um, those with eosinophilia, the PCP-PCR has been positive unless the children were on, um, uh, were on Bactrim. And, and moreover, Survival seems to be associated with um, uh, being maintained on PCP prophylaxis. The lung disease does course with the start point of the anti-IL-1 and IL-6. So the kinds of questions for this audience. The bacterium doesn't get rid of the lung oh, disease. Oh, yeah. Well, the bacterium doesn't, doesn't cure, the, cure the lung disease. There are, for a hopeful note, there are some children whose lung disease seems like it has resolved. We don't quite know how that how that occurs. We don't have enough information. Have not looked at that um, that piece as specifically. So for for this audience, we're wanting, wondering what are the possibilities of the immune alteration that results from inhibiting IL one or IL six that relates to a permissive environment for lung disease, uh, infection, inflammation, some combination. As for the profound lymphocytopenia, is there is this expected in a way that we have not considered? 
And also, as I uh, mentioned, that we have about 23 cases that have an impressive prodromal single spike of per peripheral eosinophilia. We know that there's a mouse model. You can see that in pneumocystis, wondering if there are any other thoughts. And then um, lastly, and that leads up to Matt's um, patient, uh, trisomy 21, uh, statistically, 1 in 700 live births have trisomy 21. When you look at statistics for SJIA, trisomy 21 does not have an increased risk. However, in our group, we have six cases of trisomy 21 out of 61. That's um, 10%. So is there some mechanism that could predict a constitutive special risk of IL-1 or IL-6 inhibition in these children? And all of them um, have that. The lung pathology that Ian um, talked about is predominantly an acute alveolar injury with lipoproteinaceous uh, filling. It looks like you saturate the ability for the macrophages to um, gobble this up. And some children also have endogenous, endogenous light, uh, ELP, endogenous Lipoid pneumonia. Lipoid pneumonia, sorry. And, and the trisomy cases all have the endogenous lipoid pneumonia. There's also pulmonary hypertension that can be associated with the um, proteinaceous uh, process, or it can be seem seemingly entirely separate. So we have questions about an unknown lung disease, young children, high fatality, and new medication. So I'm going to stop there and let people ask questions for Ian. And then when Matt's ready, I think we're ready for him. Thank you. I'm ready anytime. Did anybody else want to um, ask a question? Oh, there's some attendee chats here. Um, perhaps we're overcalling SJIA and should start sequencing all of these. So Can does you make a comment? Yeah. Okay, so we uh, have 20 individuals who have had whole exome sequencing, two who have whole, of those 20 have also had whole genome sequencing. There does not appear to be a monogenic explanation for this disease, at least not in terms of something that you would see on whole exome sequencing or on whole genome sequencing, but of course that's two, and, and I would just, you know, I'm not sure we really know yet how to analyze whole genome sequencing well enough. So on whole exome, there's not a monogenic disorder that seems to be uh, an explanation for this. We are now looking though for patterns of shared rare alleles, and we made our threshold um, more uh, less rigorous, more generous uh, for cutoff for on exact, um, so on a database, anything that is less than 5% allele frequency in the population, we're looking for shared allele, rare alleles among these 20 children. And I don't have the answer for that yet, but that's the approach we're taking. One thing that we have thought about is whether, because, bec is whether there are among these children, some that are heterozygous for mutations that uh, can give you a homozygous cause for, uh, sorry, I'm not saying this very smoothly, for alveolar proteinosis, for lipoproteinaceous material buildup in the lung. So surfactant mutations can do that in, uh, in children. And then in adults, uh, antibodies to GMCSF can give you a somewhat similar pattern. The reason I put it in that in that way is because there are things about this pathology that do not look like adult PAP and things that don't look exactly like a pediatric or infantile PAP that comes from surfactant mutations. So we did look though to see if there were if the, any of these children were heterozygous for any of the surfactant mutations. And the answer was that one child out of 20 is heterozygous for a surfactant protein C mutation. And there may be also uh, another child who has a rare allele of surfactant protein A. That's out of 20 children where we have that kind of information. Uh, let me see, was there any? And, and in terms of anti-GMCSF antibodies, where those have been looked for, they have been negative, but they have not been looked for in all children. There was one child who sadly is deceased who at the very end of her course apparently developed anti-GMCSF antibodies, but hadn't had them prior to, and they've been looked for prior to the development of lung disease. So 
that's, uh, oh, do you want to add what you're saying, what you're typing? Um, I think everybody can see what, I, what okay. I'm typing here. There's been a little um, correspondence going on about um, uh, pathology and other conditions. So I, okay. it's probably quicker for me to go through um, the ones I haven't uh, okay. answered. So any finding of cholesterol granulomas? There's cholesterol clefts. There is no granulomatous for formation, with the exception of one patient with trisomy 21 did have some granulomas, and that will be Matt's case that we, will, we should get to. Um, there is, um, uh, there are two children who um, later on during the course of therapy and uh, looking at uh, genetics are compound heterozygote for HLH. Um, one was deceased quite quickly and one is still part of the group. But overall, um, since many of these children did have MAS, a number of them were looked, uh, had, uh, had the panel done for HLH genes, and they do not, as a group, show heterozygosity for HLH genes. Although, of course, there are more genes being added to that list of um, potential hits for heterozygosity. That's interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Mark, for that comment. Um, I think we should probably get to Matt's case. Okay. Oh, CMV, occasionally we see CMVJ. Um, and um, uh, it seems to be um, after you increase the immune, immune suppression and, and during the course. There have been some children that are CMV positive, somewhat quixotically, who seem to be otherwise doing relatively well. And on just usual doses, I'm thinking of a child on anakinra, on, not on steroids, who would, who would periodically come up with CMV when she looked inflamed. Okay, I'm going to mute myself and let that. All right. And uh, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So this is a now three-year-old girl who was born in May of 2014 with trisomy 21. At the age of three months, she underwent a cardiac surgery, typical uh, lesion that this population has, and she did fine. Then she was hospitalized right after Thanksgiving of 2014 with high fevers and rash. So she underwent an extensive infectious and cardiologic evaluation, multiple blood cultures, echocardiograms, all sorts of testing, and everything was negative. And they involved us in December, and I saw her in the hospital and tentatively diagnosed her with MAS, just based upon the negative infectious evaluation and the fever and the rash in this six-month-old girl. So the labs at the time showed inflammation, really not all that compelling for active MAS. They actually do get worse later on. But her CRP was 12 and increased 18 milligrams per deciliter, so normal is less than one. ESR was high, which is, you know, is the opposite of what you expect in MAS. Same with the Y count being high. And her ferritin started off 500 range, then did increase to 2,800 a little later on. So after some discussions, we convinced the family and the primary team to start her on Anakinra, and that was started around Christmas time of 2014. And she immediately um, responded to it very well. Her CBC and ESR normalized. Her ferritin dropped to 339, which is a little bit high, but not, not that much. And she was doing very well. She went home on daily anakinra, 100 milligrams per day, which is a fairly substantial dose for, um, for her, for her weight. Then she came back in of March, in March of 2015. So now she's 10 months old with a flare. And we tried doubling her anakinra dose. I didn't capture it. So we had to send her home on cyclosporin and prednisolone, some of the tr standard treatments that you'd use for macrophage activation syndrome. We also at that time consulted oncology for consideration for a bone marrow transplant. We had either then or previously sent the MAS genetic panel to Cincinnati and that came back negative. But given her age and what seems to be chronic MAS, we thought there's un undoubtedly some sort of genetic cause which still hasn't been found. So in March 2015, this admission or readmission, now she does look a bit more like MAS than she did previously. So her platelet count is 115. Her ESR now is lower than what it was. Her ferritin is higher than it was. Her D-dimers is high. This, um, I must confess, was not measured the first time. 
and we sent a soluble IL-2 receptor, which is a little bit outside the normal range, so a little bit in the high side. So she went home in March, and she was on or prednisolone, about probably about three to six milligrams per day, per day, which is a fairly high dose for for anyone, but especially for her, for a baby. And then we had an elective admission uh, in June 2015, and she's also on cyclosporin and twice daily anakinra. So we had an elective admission in June 2015, and she previously had a bone marrow aspiration as part of her initial evaluation. But this is going to be repeated, and we're planning on having oncology evaluate her for a bone marrow transplant. So she admitted she was doing relatively well at this time, and she was found to have an oxygen requirement. So bronchoscopy and the CT chest were performed. Bronchoscopy, June 2015, showed mild acute inflammation. This I'm taking this direct from the, from the report. Scattered hemosiderin laden macrophages, moderate lipid laden macrophages, and it was negative for fungi, pneumocystis, and mycobacteria. Then she had a CT chest, and looking back over her records, it turned out she had one in December of 2014. I'm not sure what, why this was done. She wasn't having any respiratory symptoms, so I imagine it was part of an um, evaluation for malignancy. She probably had CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis at the time. So in December of 2014, overall looked pretty good, small bilateral pleural fusions. Again, this is before she had an O2 requirement. Mild airspace disease in both lower lobes could be atelectasis. And looking back, I wonder if this was some of the early findings or perhaps not. Then in June, when she was first found to have an O2 requirement, then the key findings was patchy bilateral lung disease, some of more confluent in the lower lobes. And the following month, this was repeated and it was worse. This was diffuse interstitial thickening in the lungs bilaterally, patchy alve alveolar opacities in the lower lung zones, left greater than right. So then we decided, or oncology decided not to pursue bone marrow transplant. So no family members were matches, including her sister, same mom, same dad, but she wasn't a match. Um, the ILD that we just discovered that she had itself posed an increased risk. And my understanding from the conversations with oncology is that her trisomy 21 is either a risk of not for the bone marrow transplant and the atopicide conditioning would somehow this um, put her at higher risk as well. And they said there's greater than even odds that she would not survive this procedure. So we maintained her on the treatments that she was on, the prednisolone, anakinra, and cyclosporin. And over the next year, through the middle of 2000, early mid-2016, she's on anakinra, 100 twice daily, cyclosporin, and prednisolone. Then in March 2015, so going back to her admission when she was started on these medicines, we did put her on prophylaxis with acyclovir, Bactrim, and fluconazole, which in retrospect is probably a, a very good choice that was made at the time. Um, anytime we tried to get her prednisolone dose below 69 milligrams, generally she had a fever, the labs went up or went down in the wrong direction. Um, so we just could not, could not lower this at all. So we arranged for her to have a second opinion at Cincinnati in June 2016, and she went, um, and she underwent lung biopsy in July. So I see question was asked: Was the ILD in June CT obscured by the airspace disease, or did it increase in a month? And it's a good question. I don't know how we would know that, how we would answer that. So Cincinnati saw her, Alexei Grome and some colleagues there evaluated her, and they performed whole exome that, as we just heard, this is not all that informative. She had normal CD3 subsets, all of the absolute values were low. We heard that lymphopenia, this is a very striking finding in her. Her lymphocyte counts were normal, 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 until March when she was admitted with um, the second flare of MAS, and they've been low since then. Multiple cytokines were all within normal ranges. Quantitative immunoglobulins were normal. The one lab that stands out here was the IL-18, which was over 33,000. I don't, maybe Scott may have what the normal range was. I didn't see that in the report they sent me. But, um, I, my understanding is that this is 
strikingly elevated. Okay, so less than 500 is normal, thank you. So they did the biopsy in July of 2016, and I'll just uh, hit some of the key points that I've underlined. The alveolar continents include single to tightly aggregated histiocytes. In most alveoli, there's PAS positive granular to occasionally globular substance with cholesterol clefts. Granulomas of variable ages are present in air spaces and coalesce, coalesce as well. And the biopsy goes on to say that the interstitium is expanded and fibrotic with areas that are established as well as younger. And um, the interstitial lymphocytes are CD3 with some clustering, some CD20 positive B cells are present as well, um, plasma cells, and there are no fungal or pneumocystis organisms by the special stains. Um, finally concluded differential etiologies are alveolar prophemiosis, extensive cholesterol pneumonia, and surfactant related disorders. Yes, she was in Bactrim. She's been in Bactrim since March of 2015. So we had lengthy conversations, dry had lengthy conversations with the, my colleagues in Cincinnati, Dr. Grom and colleagues who saw her at the time. Um, we bounced around IL-18 blockade, but that really would not be easy to get hold of. So eventually we decided upon adding Humira. And the rationale was this, and this may have just been pure luck this work, but the rationale was that for other granulomatous diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, particularly Crohn's disease, and um, sarcoid, the TNF inhibition works very well. Uh, we know we need to add some things. We added Humira to her anakinra. Again, Humira is an antibody directed against TNF. And the decision was made to start this in July or so, July and August, but we didn't get it approved until October. So for a period of time, she was on both anakinra as well as Humira, along cyclosporin and prednisolone. So, and she strikingly improved with the addition of this therapy. We were able to lower her prednisolone from 7.5 milligrams down to three milligrams daily. She no longer had a daytime oxygen requirement. This is the first time since all this started since March, I'm sorry, since June of 2015 that she did not require O2 during the day and her nighttime oxygen dropped as well. So we repeated her CT chest. And the official read is diffuse septal thickening with left greater than right bilateral ground glass opacities throughout the lungs, numerous small cystic areas. So I sent the CT over to Cincinnati. They obtained a CT chest while she was there as well. So this is now a CT that was done in December after she'd been on Humira for about two months and they're comparing it with a CT that they'd obtained in June of 2016 before the biopsy. And their e Alexei's email wrote that there's clearly less ground glass opacification in the current study relative to ours from the spring. There also appears to be stable and persistent septal line thickening, suggesting a chronic fibrotic process that has remained. Here we go. So then she had a setback. February of this year, she was hospitalized for respiratory distress and fever in the blood culture group Streptococcus pneumoniae serotype 23A. So based upon this, she is, uh, to my knowledge, fully vaccinated. Um, based upon this, we sent the vaccine response. So at the time that she was hospitalized, she was on the same medicines, Humira, Anakinra, Cyclosporin, and prednisolone three milligrams daily. So um, we sent a vaccine response that was negative to everything, to all the serotypes that were in the, whichever vaccine she would have received which were negative. We did not obtain a CD4 count at this time. The only um, one I know that she had done was in Cincinnati. So during her illness, we stopped cyclosporin. We also gave her a short prednisolone burst due to the markers of MAS um, that had arisen during this hospitalization. So then after she went home, she survived the hospitalization. After she went home, we kept her off of cyclosporin. 
We tapered her prednisolone. She'd been up to about 7.5 while she was in the hospital. We lowered it back down to three milligrams daily over the next two weeks. Then by April, we tapered her off the anakinra, first dropping to once daily, then stopping it completely. We continued to taper her prednisolone, now down to 2.5 milligrams, I'm sorry, 2.4 milligrams daily, which is about 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. She remains on the prophylactic therapy and we obtained a CT chest in August of 2017. This was actually done in, um, by Lisa Young, a pulmonologist in Nashville. And she read this and said that her CT, her, on her read, this chest CT shows diffuse intralobular lobular septal thickening and some ground glass opacities, overall similar or slightly less prominent than prior scans in December as well as in April 2016. And um, she's still actually doing very well from a symptomatic standpoint. We're going to get some labs later this week to see how she's doing and to try to work her off the prednisolone eventually. And so that's my last slide. And if anyone has questions or comments, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Matt, her current, her current medication is simply the alinumab and you're trying to get uh, to taper off the prednisolone? Correct. She's on the humidor of 40 milligrams every other week, the standard adult dose. And right, she's on prednisone uh, or prednisolone or pred 2.4 milligrams daily. And my plan is to get her off of this and just have her maintain on Humira as monotherapy. And then I may at some point try to wean her off of that as well, but that's first the steroids. Um, I should mention also that on um, Ian's slide, um, uh, he talked about the growth arrest. So we've gone through the, um, I've gone through some of the cases that had growth arrest and the percentiles um, go down as the prednisone goes up. So, so far we think uh, very high level look, it looks like this is um, steroid growth arrest. Um, and then somebody's just asked you whether whether she had an eosinophil spike. I I don't recall she if did. you so she I, did. At that, I pulled that up during Ian's talk, and in December she did not. But then beginning in uh, what, oh, of what year before before it yeah. or during the so at the time of diagnosis she did not. But then. Beginning around January 2015 through March of the same year, her EO count was around 3.8%, 10%. This is also then down to 5.6, 7.5, 12. All this is also when, as you know, her lymphocyte count and white blood cell count as a whole decreased. But yes, yeah, she did have an EO count, EO spike from about March, January through March of 2015, which is right when after the MAS had started. But before, um, before the interstitial lung disease, and then by March of 2015, which is when she was started on cyclosporin and chronic steroids, her EOs had normalized and they've remained normal for the next three years, or two and a half years rather. Yeah, that's that's typical. What we see is a single spike beforehand. And it can be um, in the face of, uh, of steroids. So I don't know if anybody wants to um, comment on that in the attendee. So her spike took place before the steroids. The steroids really got started in March of 2015. And the spike started, looks like in January. So the other question that, though, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that, that's. That's, that's more typical because eosinophils tend to be very um, steroid responsive. Um, and, and these children, when they're having their spike of eosinophils, are becoming more inflammatory and they end up on steroids. And my comment was only that there are a few that, although they were on what everybody would call significant steroids, it did not completely um, ablate that response, which was, um, I think it shows the... Um, I don't know. We have any five, any IL five um, uh, levels. Uh, there was um, a child who went on um, uh, anti IgE for this odd rash that is um, splotchy, somewhat exhibitous, incredibly um, pyritic, 
And um, because it seemed perhaps akin to urticarial response, um, there was no response to um, to Zolaire in that child. I don't think anybody else tried that. We don't have IL-5. One of the comments is that she did have the lymphopenia that you had mentioned, and this started around March as well, 2015, March to April 2015. So when she was putting the chronic steroids, she became lymphopenic and has remained such. Even as she's gotten clinically improved, her lymphocyte count is still hovering around the 1 to 1.5 range. Yeah, if anybody has any comments on the dramatic lymphopenia that we see across across the cases, you know, as I said that, um, uh, like below 50% of the lower limits of normal um, per age. So um, uh, this is, you know, really within the the range where in JS are about CD4 counts in that range, um, they are very much in the HIV range. The question came up with she on IVIG. That's a good thought. We haven't done that. Um, and she really, that's been her only, I mean, that's a very serious infection, but it's been her only infection of note in quite a while. And since then, she's been off the cyclosporin, which has probably did more to put her at, or a lot to put her at, at risk for this. Uh, does her lymphopenia course only with her with her um, uh, steroid dosage? I it started around the same time the steroids were started. I haven't looked at it close enough to see if it really correlates with it in terms of when the steroids go up, the lymphopenia goes down, and and vice versa. Yeah, I can. That would take me. A, a little longer than we have to, to answer that question. And then Michael Goodman is um, letting us know that trisomy 21 is often associated with lymphopenia. There are six cases um, uh, out of the 61 that are trisomy 21, and I can tell you that we have some you know, small children that get their um, ALCs down to 0 0.6, so only 600 lymphocytes. So um, to talk about this being profound, I, I can't emphasize that, that enough. And those aren't necessarily children that are on steroids because not all these children are on steroids, but it's a very good thought to look for correlation. Is it understood what the association might be based on with trisomy 21 and lymphopenia? I guess, Michael, I don't know whether you can actually talk or can only, I think you can can only, only type. type. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, or if you know of references that you can send us, say that again. Okay. Is there a mechanism understood for trisomy 21 association with lymphopenia? Yeah, and for the question about TREX, um, we could certainly try to do that. Uh, I don't. We we. I, I don't think it's been done on any of the patients that we know of. At least nobody put that into the CRF. Um, but yes, we could certainly do that, or ask everybody to do that. Depending on how much blood is involved, I'm sure the family would be okay with that. So uh, talking offline, we can try to figure that out. Yeah. Okay, so you don't think it's so you don't think it's clear. Okay, it seems like overall, uh, but I, I wouldn't say that we've done a, a really extensive literature search. So we, we're open to anybody sending us suggested um, references to. Um, but it seems like the immune deficiency in trisomy twenty one is not very clearly understood, at least mechanistically. Does anybody have a different sense than that? I think that this is Kelly. I think that's true. Um, and it's just because the picture is quite variable. I mean, there are some patients with, you know, not that it's exactly the same, but, you know, in DeGeorge, the lymphopenia is very variable. Yeah. It can be zero, yeah. it can be 500. You know, we can pick these people yeah. up with tracks. And so um, because of that, we really just don't know. Um, except yeah. we know that it's very well associated. It's one of the most common syndromes that are associated with immune deficiency. Um, 
So, yeah. Um, we also, um, we asked the folks uh, at Novartis and they shared with us the um, laboratory data and there are 147 children that were on the SJA uh, clinical trial to, for getting the approval for the use of uh, canakinumab in uh, SJIA. Um, they did not see lymphopenia. Um, if they had a few that had eosinophilia, but maybe one out of the 147 had over 400 eosinophils. So, um, uh, so I think these laboratory abnormalities that we noted, and those were not trisomy 21 children, um, uh, were across the class. Yeah, so um, uh, Jay mentions that um, uh, ALL is more steroid sensitive, and I, I believe that in the pediatric oncology world that the dosing of the um, chemotherapeutics are decreased in trisomy 21 because of their sensitivity. We've, we've not been using that metric that I can see in uh, children with SJIA that have trisomy 21, but it's not a very common occurrence just in our, our case series. Kelly, do you have anything else to say? Sorry, I think I was muted. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that, I think Jay Cole just sent you a review that it is, Carl sent it, um, that is pretty decent for um, an overview for uh, trisomy 21 in general. It talks about the immune factors and non-immune factors. It talks about naive lymphocytes. It talks about the chemostasis. It talks about um, impaired mitogen um, proliferation as well. So I think that's probably a good one just to kind of go over. Um, but I don't have anything else. I think this was an excellent um you know, area of discussion, because uh, as immunologists, the way we look at things is very mechanistic driven. And, and you know, um, your patients with a lot of their um, biologic use and affecting different pathways, but having, you know, it really profound lymphopenia um, throughout is, it, it gives us a lot to think about, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think these cases were really excellent. And, um, showed a, again, a variable presentation of something that is a common um, condition for you guys um, and but can present somewhat similarly to some of our um, complex immune patients. I guess a, a last uh, uh, comment is that uh, the kind of pathology that we see when you're looking at um, lung pathology, lung pathology that, that you see, uh, when you look at connective tissue disease associated ILD, you see a, a, a pattern of NSIP. We're not seeing that. And that um, what we're seeing on the lung pathology for the children with, um, with trisomy 21 is, uh, appears to be the same on pathology as, as uh, the, the, large, the large group, which is most of, most of the patients, it may be a little more intense and have more endogenous okay. lipoid pneumonia. The CT scans um, uh, tend to look uh, uh, different in some respects. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to everybody. I'm, um, I found this very helpful and, and um, uh, uh, big round of applause to Ian and to Matt. These are very complicated questions, uh, very complicated cases, very complicated questions, and it's a lot of work to put these together. And you can see how we're trying to figure this out in, uh, in a world that is phenomenally medically complex. And we really thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everybody for attending. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.